Welcome to Top Tower Review, the show where we look back at media through the ages. And today we're exploring some of the most eerie, spine-tingling tales of lost media that I could find. Prepare for murder, negligence, and of course, mystery. Consider this your opportunity to turn back. If you end up having nightmares as we enter some of the darkest corners of entertainment history, well, you've been warned. For the brave who are staying with us this Halloween season, turn off the lights, pull on some headphones, and relax. I have no mouth and I must scream. I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream is a post-apocalyptic science fiction short story written by Harlan Ellison. It was apparently written by Ellison in a single night in 1966 and was submitted without changing a single word from his very first draft. The story revolves around a post-Cold War apocalypse, wherein the USA, the Soviet Union, and China had each created supercomputers, known as Allied Master Computers, or AM for short, to control their war efforts. However, in classic dystopian fashion, the computers became sentient and committed mass genocide on the human race. Now 109 years after the war, AM has left just five humans alive, four men and a woman, and tortures them for all of eternity using its powers to make it impossible for the humans to commit suicide. The story is extremely well written and terrifying, dealing with serious issues such as torture, sexual assault, starvation, insanity, and more. It has been collected multiple times and won a Hugo Award in 1968. In 1995, video game developer The Dreamers Guild, game publisher Cyber Dreams, and game designer David Sears teamed up with Harlan Ellison himself to adapt the story into a point-and-click adventure game for the PC. Just as with the short story, the plot of the game takes place in a post-war dystopia run by AM, with the player taking control of one of the five human characters, each with their own story arc. The game requires the player to make horrific ethical choices, and is truly disturbing. Upon release, the game was a massive commercial failure, and therefore faded into obscurity. However, it should be noted that the game was critically praised, and has become somewhat of a hidden gem for the point-and-click genre in modern years. However, as scary and depressing as the game is, there is evidence that the game was even more disturbing before it was released, and was assumably required to be reeled back for a consumer audience. There is hard evidence to support that a darker, older version existed at some point, though such a version of the game remains lost to this day. The main evidence behind this older version is from a 1995 episode of the British TV program Games Master, one of the first shows to ever focus on console and PC video games, mixing reviews, previews, and gaming challenges together in a similar fashion to programming that we would see in later years, such as GeForce X-Play. This particular episode of Games Master was a quote-unquote gore special, which showcased shockingly gory moments in video games. I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream was a part of this special. Some specific parts that are present in the Games Master episode, but are not in the final game, include a scene from the character Gorister's scenario in which human bodies are seen hanging from the hooks in the meat locker. In the final game, beefsteaks are seen instead, a puppy that is caged and being electrocuted that you must feed a human heart to, and the character Benny eating a human baby. While these scenes were clearly completed enough to send to the team at Games Master, further evidence of a fully playable version of the game with the extended, more gory scenes has never surfaced, and the details regarding when or how the edits came about remain a mystery. Heartbeat in the Brain Heartbeat in the Brain is a documentary film which premiered in 1978 at the Studium Gallery in New York. The short film depicts Amanda Fielding, a British art student, scientist, and drug policy reform advocate as she attempts a trepanation of her own skull. Trepanation is an ancient and out-of-use pseudoscientific procedure in which the subject has a small hole bored out of their skull. The purpose of the procedure is to create a release of pressure surrounding the brain, allowing blood to flow freely around it. In ancient times, it was used to, quote, rid the body of evil spirits, and is theorized by many historians to have been a form of treatment for then unknown psychological disorders, such as schizophrenia, and can be seen on the skeletons of persons from as far back as 8,000 years ago. In the modern day, those who argue for the use of trepanation, such as misfielding, argue that the additional blood flow to the brain would elevate the subject to a higher level of consciousness and create a form of 24-7 high. Fielding apparently spent nearly four years trying to find a doctor who would be willing to 
perform the surgery on her, but none would agree, saying that its use was not founded in science. As a result, at the age of 27, Fielding performed the trepanation on herself, in her studio apartment, in front of a mirror with an electric drill. Fielding first got the idea to receive a trepanation after meeting her then-boyfriend, Bart Hugis. Hugis went on to meet a man named Joseph Mellon, whom he later called a, quote, sort of John the Baptist. In the 1960s, at the infamous party scenes of Ibiza, Hugis was introduced to LSD and subsequently met with the idea of self-trepanation. It was through Mellon that Hugis and Fielding met, and eventually Hugis performed the act on himself in 1965. The trepanation apparently took 45 minutes to perform, and hours afterwards to clean up all the blood. Hugis called the act, quote, like trying to uncork a bottle from the inside. After claiming the theorized effects on his consciousness were indeed real, he convinced Fielding to perform a trepanation on herself as well, and she decided to document the experience on film. The film consists of raw footage of Fielding's self-trepanation, including her buzzing her hair and taking the drill directly to her skull, blood and all. Apparently, the climax of the ordeal, when Fielding successfully pierced through the bone, was so disturbing, multiple audience members at the Sodium Gallery fainted. The film was not shown again after the original 1978 premiere until April of 2011, when it was showcased at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London. Additionally, clips from the short film can be seen in a 1998 documentary on the subject by Eli Cabilio titled A Hole in the Head, and in the sixth episode of the third season of Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, a documentary program by Hamilton Morris about the history and culture of various drugs around the world. Other than these snippets in Cabilio's documentary and Morris's episode, the film is lost in its entirety, having only been shown at the two gallery premieres in 1978 and 2011, and nowhere else. Today, Fielding is married with children, and continues to advocate for both drug policy reform and for mainstream acceptance of trepanation as a legitimate medical procedure. She must truly believe it worked, as she went on to get a second hole cut into her skull in the year 2000 after believing the first to have closed up. She has even spoken about her experiences in front of Parliament, though as it stands now, there doesn't seem to be a large push for trepanation to become widely accepted. The Cuckoo Clocks of Hell Last House on Dead End Street is a 1977 horror film that was written, directed, produced by, and starring Roger Watkins. Watkins was a young 24 years old at the time of the film's production, and was relatively unknown. The film is heavily inspired by the real-life Manson murders of Sharon Tate Polanski and four others in the summer of 1969. The film depicts the story of a group of people led by Watkins' Manson character as they murder a film director and several others. The film is notable for being her horrifically gory, with many at the time even believing the on-screen murders to be real. Watkins shows everything, from a woman being burned with a hot poker, a woman who is dismembered and disemboweled while she is still conscious, and the Polanski director character having an electric drill bored into his eye socket. I have to note, if you choose to watch this film, do so knowing these facts. Even as a horror buff, it was particularly disturbing, and feels like you are watching a series of real snuff films, though I suppose that can be seen as a testament to to Watkins' skill as a director. Not helping these rumors about the murders being real was the fact that Watkins, in true Manson fashion, used fake names for all involved in the credits, making anyone in the cast or crew extremely difficult to track down. Additionally, he used a full cast of unknown, small-time actors, and filmed the project on a minuscule budget in New York State. The film premiered in 1973 at the Cannes International Film Festival. However, it did not have the title it is known by today, Last House on Dead End Street but rather The Cuckoo Clocks of Hell, a reference to the famous Kurt Vonnegut story, Mother Night. The film's cut was also over three hours long. However, this cut was supposedly so horrifically gory, the film's showing caused the audience members to start rioting. In reaction, the film was then recut and premiered four years later in 1977 as The Fun House, and became a notable work of the grindhouse genre for decades to come. In 1979, the Cinematic Releasing Corporation acquired the rights to distribute the film, and re-released it with the title, The Last House on Dead End Street, the title it is still known by today. In an attempt to capitalize on the success of Wes Craven's directorial debut, The Last House on the Left, 
with the runtime now sitting at a comparatively small 77 minutes. Considering how gruesome the 1977 version is, and the reaction of the audience to the original premiere, it makes one wonder how bad the Cuckoo Clock's cut actually was. Unfortunately, nobody who was not at the premiere knows, as the original 1973 version of the Cuckoo Clocks of Hell remains lost to this day. Some say the footage was destroyed, so as to prevent any further rioting from happening, if it were to be released, though others claim that both Watkins himself and the New York Film Archive have copies of the three-hour print. As of the making of this video, however, these are simply rumors. Before the film's premiere at Cannes, Watkins was asked about the extreme violence in the film. I personally find his response very thought-provoking, and I believe it showed his big-picture perspective when making such a horrific film. Quote, This film will get an R rating. It should be an X, but it's sex that frightens most Americans, so sex gets the X ratings. Americans love violence perhaps the way they should love sex. I'm not moralizing with this picture. It's not making a sociological statement. I'm interested only in the dark side of the personality. This picture is pure horror. It's not any more complicated than that. Noah's Ark Noah's Ark is a 1928 film by Warner Brothers, directed by Michael Curtis. The film is a fascinating example of what is known as a half-talkie, a film released in the middle of the transition from silent film to sound, which led to most of the picture being silent, but with specific sections, most notably important scenes of dialogue having sound. Back in 1928, Half Talkies had a matching symphonic score, playing over most of the film, while the sound pieces were played separately of the film itself on a Vitaphone disc system. These early films, with their orchestras and separate sound systems which needed to be timed properly, not to mention the multiple reels of film which needed to be swapped during the picture, led to the occupation of film exhibition becoming an art form in and of itself position which has nearly completely died with the modern digital age. However, unfortunately, Noah's Ark is remembered for another major change in the movie-making pipeline, which is much darker and a lot less glamorous. Specifically, the creation of stricter regulations in the performance of stunt scenes for film. The major flood scene at the climax of the film, depicting that of the timeless Bible story, reportedly used over 600,000 gallons of real water so viciously that death and serious bodily harm resulted. Apparently, hundreds of extra were rounded up to perform the scene, completely unaware of what was about to happen. Then, suddenly, the hundreds of thousands of gallons of water were dumped in. Many of the extras reportedly did not know how to swim, and were never told they would need to. Ultimately, as a result, the footage in the film of the civilians desperately trying not to drown is completely real. Two extras drowned to death. One was so severely injured that his leg needed to be amputated. Dozens more had broken bones, and the lead actress in the picture, Dolores Costello, caught a severe case of pneumonia. One of the most interesting bits of trivia about this deadly scene was that among the extras who nearly died but thankfully survived was a 20-year-old John Wayne, who also worked in the prop department on the film, as well as Andy Devine and Ward Bond. Such facts make it easy to wonder how many of the people lost or maimed in the accident could have become the next great actor in American cinema. Horrifically, the studio kept most of the scene in the final picture, with the images of innocent extras fighting for their lives remaining on screen. The film's length of 135 minutes was cut down to just 100 minutes as a result of the backlash that came after the film's release. While the 100-minute version still contains some of the flood scenes and is readily available to watch today, the 135-minute version was reportedly much more disturbing and disrespectful. The 135-minute long version of the film, with the deadly scenes, nearly a century after its release, remains lost. A combined effort by the UCLA Film and Television Archive and the project team known as American Movie Makers the Dawn of Sound, have restored the film to a length of 108 minutes, mostly by including the overture and exit music missing from the 100-minute version. Perhaps it is better that the deadly scenes remain missing, out of respect for those who literally lost life and limb. While tragic accidents do still occasionally occur, thankfully the regulations set forth after this disaster made a significant impact on the safety of film stunts moving forward. Jonestown. In 1954, in the state of Indiana, a man by the name of Jim Jones created a church known then as the Wings of Deliverance, which would later go on to be known as the People's Temple of the Disciples of Christ. Jones was a communist who was angry with the way the people of his party were treated during the Red Scare of the 1950s, and as a result, created a church with extreme socialist ideals focused on racial equality. In reality, 
Jones was an atheist and was primarily using the church as a means to further his social and political agenda. To gain a following, Jones reportedly faked faith healings on a regular basis, using chicken livers and other animal byproducts to trick his followers into believing it was cancerous tissue that was miraculously expelled from those he healed. This malicious plan worked, and soon the People's Temple had a congregation in the thousands. Eventually, the church moved from Indiana to San Francisco, California, a climate more comfortable with Jones's views on racial integration. Throughout the 1960s and 1970s, Jones's church was applauded for its progressive views during the height of the Civil Rights Movement, with Jones even receiving a Martin Luther King Jr. Humanitarian Award in 1977. Jones and the People's Temple regularly met with high-profile politicians and played a key role in the 1975 election of San Francisco Mayor George Moscone. Generally speaking, Jones had a positive social position in society and in the media. However, underneath the facade of the People's Temple sat a corrupt, horrific cult. In 1973, radio host Lester Kinsolving published the testimony of eight members of the People's Temple who defected and claimed they feared for their lives. After defecting and leaving California, the eight members armed themselves with guns and escaped to Montana, nearly to the Canadian border. They avoided the highway during the entirety of their trip, out of fears that Jones would have them tracked down, a suspicion that later proved factual, as Jones had indeed sent a chartered plane to scout the highways in search of their vehicle. Claims of horrific conditions, control over its members' lives, and other events consistent with cult-like behavior came out of these reports. It wasn't until a few years later, however, that investigative journalists truly began to crack down on the People's Temple. Eventually, Jones purchased a plot of land in Guyana, the only English-speaking country in the continent of South America. Here, Jones created a place for select member of his church to move to. Members who did so were promised a warm utopia where they could fully live within their socialist ideals. Jones called it, quote, a socialist paradise and a sanctuary from the media. Jones named the plot of land the People's Temple Agricultural Project, but it quickly became known as simply Jonestown. By the late 1970s, 900 members of the People's Temple had moved to Jonestown. After a large portion of the church's membership moved to Guyana, Jones began, quote-unquote, educating its adult members, painting the United States as an enemy and glamorizing communist leaders such as Kim Il-sung of North Korea. After inquiries into the People's Temple following the reports of defectors, on November 18, 1978, the United States government sent Congressman Leo Ryan and a group of broadcast journalists from NBC and other news outlets to Jonestown to further investigate and interview Jones. Jones welcomed Ryan and his crew, throwing a large party in the village square which included food, live music, and more. Shortly into the visit, however, Congressman Ryan and the journalists became suspicious after reporting that nearly everyone they interacted with from the People's Temple seemed to be behaving in a rehearsed manner. Later on that day, several members of the church approached Ryan's party and begged them to take them back to the United States, claiming that they were being held against their will in, quote, nothing but a communist prison camp. Ryan and the NBC crew, along with the small group of church members who wished to leave, then headed to the local airstrip to depart back to Washington. Jones correctly suspected that his ruse did not fool Ryan, and that the investigation would ultimately result in government intervention and his losing control of the People's Temple. With this in mind, Jones sent a group of his most fanatical followers to the airstrip to attack the Ryan party before they could leave. Congressman Ryan, NBC reporter Don Harris, NBC cameraman Bob Brown, examiner photographer Greg Robinson, and a People's Temple defector by the name of Patricia Park were all killed by gunfire from the attacking members of the People's Temple. Shortly thereafter, Jones filled a giant metal tub with grape flavor aid, which he laced with cyanide, and told his congregation that they must all commit, quote, revolutionary suicide by drinking the concoction, and that anybody who refused would be mercilessly killed. As a result, most everyone involved did so. The poison took 20 to 30 minutes to kill a healthy adult, while it only took five minutes for children. A survivor and escaped People's Temple member by the name of Odell Rhodes would go on to describe a scene of mass hysteria as parents watched their children die from the poison, saying, quote, Once people started to see the poison take effect, they showed a reluctance to die, but that eventually, most present, quote, waited quietly for their turn to die. In total, 909 individuals lost their lives in Jonestown, 605 adults, and 304 children. Footage from the NBC crew's time in Jonestown was recorded. Included in this footage are several minutes of the shooting that killed Brown and other members of the Ryan party, as Brown's camera had been rolling at the time of the attack. While some of the footage was later used in reports and documentaries on the subject, nearly all of the NBC footage remains lost to this day. In 2014, one hour of footage from the military walkthrough after the mass suicide surfaced online. Over the years, several people have submitted Freedom of Information Act requests to the FBI for the NBC footage, 
as it was turned over to the Bureau after the tragedy. However, as of yet, these submissions have not resulted in the release of any footage. It is unclear how much footage either the United States government and or NBC themselves have in their archives. However, journalists at NBC have claimed in the past to have reviewed, quote, multiple hours from the day of the tragedy. Jonestown was the single largest loss of American civilian life in a deliberate act up until the attack on the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. And there you have it, five deeply dark and disturbing cases of lost media. Thank you all so much for watching, and for the support you have shown the channel over the past year. We are nearing 1,000 subscribers, and I am truly grateful. Have a happy Halloween. This has been Silence, signing out. I'll see you all next time on Top Tower Review.